more Dragon's Dogma 2. I think that's what we need. That's what we need today. I'm going to be honest. I didn't look at the last one. I didn't look at the last one that they dropped. But I seen they dropped this one. I just I haven't really been in tune for a second. But... This is thoughts after 10 hours of gameplay that we're going to watch. So let's let's see what they got. Let's see, let's see what they're going for. Let's see what we can find. Obviously, they got the party I system. It would be a simple side quest. The owner of an apothecary enlisted my help to find his lost grandson who had been taken from Okay. Wolves. As I followed the trail, I heard a screeching noise from up above. Is it a dragon? Or is it a griffin? What is it? It is a griffin. All of a sudden, I'm in a battle for my life against a griffin. It's a monster that's... And he immediately puts his face in his ass. So the, the, they are carrying on the grabbing on. We know that grabbing on to enemies, which was an amazing system back in the day. Great system. Especially for when it came out. It was like, you know, Shadow of the Colossus, which is crazy that we have those two are really like the examples of that style of gameplay. It's far too strong for my party to handle, but we fight and claw and hold our ground until finally we get it to retreat. I breathe a sigh of relief. Oh, so they, the it just runs. You, they didn't even get to kill it? Damn. All right, so it looks like strong for my party to handle, but what? we fight. Mighty sweep, stone splitter, and then they sheet. Okay, sheath and draw. A whole button dedicated to sheath and drawing on the back there. Switch weapon. Switch weapon skill. So, do you have a weapon skill active? Is that one of these, or I don't know. I don't know how that works. I don't know how the weapon system works yet. Okay, so right here you got what the party system. You can tell them what to do. Wait, go. Wait and claw and hold our ground until finally we get it to retreat. I breathe a sigh of mm -hmm, relief mm -hmm. and set up at the nearby camp and sleep till nightfall. That sleep is then interrupted by the same griffin back. Revenge. No. For revenge. And it's it's glowing eyes make it pop. I'm not gonna lie, I'm not gonna lie. Is it got a white head? What is that? A bald eagle hippogriff? An eagle griff? That fight somehow boils over into another battle with a white, who proceeds to beat me with. Dang. Okay. Do do you think that is his sword just like that, or is he using an ability there? Cause yeah, his sword's not lit up. His that sword's not lit up. Boils over into another battle and then it's lit up. Did he add to magic damage to it? Like a, like a radio, add magic to it, like a radial menu pop up and you get your little selection. Add magic to sword and you can fucking hit for extra magic damage, all that kind of shit. I did that in Elden Ring. That was like my main shit. Pull, pulling out that magic gray sword. Mm. I finally take him out. Just as the sun rises after an epic 20 minute battle. Damn. And he on the edge too. Look at his health. Okay. Getting items, black crystal. None of this was part of the actual quest involving saving the boy. It was. That just happened. So, did it. Now, my, my question is, is the hippogriff fated to come back or was the hippogriff flying randomly and happened to fly over the spot where they were camping? Because those are very different things. If it's designed that when you encounter the hippogriff, that the hippogriff will always fly back to you the next night, it's a little different. It's a little different than organically like... Yo, that never happened to me because the it never flew back over me or I killed it before it could run away or, or something like that. Like, how much variation is there? I don't know. 
It's just a series of events that cascaded into one of the most unforgettable encounters I've ever had in an open world action RPG. And it was just one of the incredible encounters I oh, yeah, experienced these... during the 10 hours I spent adventuring through. God damn. These fights are going to be so grandiose already, I can tell. The amount of scale. And these, these are like the beginning ones that they're showing. You know, what are the what are the end games gonna be like? I want to play this game so bad. I wanna I wanna play this game. Should I? Should I don't know if I should play the first one. I might have Baldur's Gate three coming in soon. Dragon's Dogma 2's fantastic open world. All right, show me more. Show me more. Hands on preview. Yes. Well, I didn't get to start from and the, the quality beginning, on this video is not that good, even though I got it bumped up. It just, Pawns, it just ain't. unfamiliar with the first Dragon's Dogma, are AI-controlled companions that gain gear, uh -huh, uh -huh. skills, and experience from your game. And then take all that with them online where they can be hired by other players to be... Can, or, well, I should say, ask, do I have to micromanage them? I mean, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just saying it's a lot of upkeep. Okay. Be companions in their own games. I'm not going to spend too much time on either pawns or character creation, especially because we've already made those videos. But what I will say is that pawns are integral to one of my big takeaways, which What's is that? that What's that? Exploration and discovery in Dragon's Dogma 2 feels much more natural than ever before. First and more... foremost, there are no more quest boards. There are no markers that appear above people's I don't know heads. Why this like... Button ain't working. More natural. I'm sure he's about to explain it, but huh. first and foremost, there are no more quest boards. There are no no more quest boards. So is it gonna be more Elden Ringish? You know, where it's just kind of see thing on the edge of the little hill, and you're like, I need to I need to find out what that is, or it's gonna bug me for the rest of the game, and then you go look at it. No markers that appear above people's heads letting you know who's got a quest and any sort of symbols placed on okay. the map to let you know of points of interest are kept to a minimum. As such, you'll really rely on your pawns and NPCs to guide you through Dragon's okay. Dogma 2's world. Yeah, yeah. So what are they going to come up and be like, the path to Elkin Reach is on the left, if my memory serves me correctly. And then somebody else will chime in and be like, well, I'm not sure about that. I don't, I don't know. I don't know if it'll work li like the banter will be there like that, but I wonder if somebody will like pipe up. Maybe the flower bed will offer some clue as to Roger's whereabouts. Hopefully it's not too much. And like every time you're looking for something, they're not. They're like, hey, it's right here. Don't want that. NPCs will more often than not. Be the ones to approach you with opportunities for side quests, as opposed to it being the other way around. Sight. Okay, that's not bad. Them coming to you. I've been playing. I've been playing a little bit of ESO just for some downtime, and I know Skyrim did the same shit. They would just run up on you while you're in the middle of a bridge in the middle of nowhere, and just be like, "Urgent letter." And then you'd start a whole you start a whole quest line and burn down a city. I don't know. You wouldn't happen to have seen a pretty stone. Do that. A pretty Just stone. In a cap, right? God damn. Point They're so aggressive. Just yonder looks to be a good spot for harvesting ingredients. Boulders that can be destroyed uh -huh, to find uh -huh. a path that leads to treasure. If you need that to destroy, I'm your boy. Oh, so you got a dude that, so they're like Pokemon where one of them can cut down trees and the other one can break rocks and the other one's got a light that can shine in the dark. Oh, okay, okay. I see what you're doing there. Shall I assist? Next power here, stealing from fucking Pokemon. It's not okay. Not okay. I, I, I don't, I don't condone uh, thievery. Mm-mm. Nuh-uh. -mm, Bad Dragon's Dogma. How dare you? Or, if they already have knowledge of a quest from their owner's game, they will straight up lead you to those quests if you give them the go-ahead. All of this leads... Oh, you just follow them. Shit. Okay. That works. That works. I've always liked... I, they've been and They've been getting a lot better at this. I have always liked in-game 
navigation systems. Ghost of Tsushima with the wind blowing. This with just following dude. Monster Hunter World. Following the little flies. It's, it's, it's an in-world navigation system. It just always feels nicer. It's always... Mm, nice touches. It's to a style of exploration and adventuring that feels very organic and appropriately rewarding, very much in the same way that Elden Ring and the two most recent Zelda games do. As alluded to in the intro oh to this my preview, God. You also Could you imagine? Just out of the darkness. It feels very organic and appropriately rewarding, very much Look, in the same nothing, way that Elden Ring and, then all and of a the sudden, two most recent Zelda games do. As you're facing a minotaur. In the intro to this preview, you also never really know what to expect once you set out to pursue a quest. Yeah, it looks like everybody. The act of exploring oh, beyond no. the safety of the city's walls is unpredictable, dangerous, and enticing. <sighs> He's not even dead. He just got kidnapped. So what if they just like? What if that's a whole like a ends up being a whole quest line that he like takes you back to his cave and hangs you upside down and you're and you're. Little party comes in while dude's out hunting, and they're just like, "We're gonna cut you down." And then you know he comes back, and you get one more fight. That'd be that'd be fucking sick. I love that. Which is why it's so exciting. No, everybody dead there. Ain't nobody coming for you. <laughs> He's gone. Over the course of my ten hours, I got to play with. Is that Anakin Skywalker? Over I think it is. Over the course of my 10 hours, I got to play with a total of 5 locations. Fighter, the, the, the physics on that role, the physics in this game are going to be superb. Over Watch this little alligator thing hours, I got rolling to play down with it. A total of five locations. Look at him. Fighter, mage, warrior, sorcerer. Fire, mage, warrior, sorcerer. Unpredictable, dangerous, and enticing. Which uh -huh. is why it's so exciting. I went back a little too far. Over the course of my 10 hours, I got to play with a total of five locations. Fighter, mage, warrior, sorcerer, and trickster. Trickster, which you can watch okay. A whole other video all about. Unlike the first game, I have not watched that video about the classes. Simply by leveling up the base ones, the two advanced vocations were actually unlocked via a quest. Maybe after I could watch that after this. Guild, I was given a quest to retrieve a great sword and an arch staff. And after doing so, mm -hmm. as I you do, both the warrior and sorcerer all the t all the time in in fantasy, it's staple. I'm I'm missing my family family heirloom axe. I I left it in a deep dark cave a hundred years ago, even though I'm thirty five. And then you go pick it up, and they're like, "Thank you so much. You can keep it, actually." And so now you have a cool axe. Locations. I don't know if all of them will be unlocked this way, and I didn't get a chance to unlock any of the hybrid ones, like hybrid spear hand or magic archer. But I definitely like that's the idea interesting. Of not we like hybrids. Locations. We we like mixing it up. So what 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 kinds could we get out of these hybrids? A fighter archer. You could get a blade attached to the outside of the bow, and then slice people up with it. That'd be fun. See. Now, you say you have, did he say trickster? Trickster. Because that just sounds like a mage thief. That's, that sounds like a mix already. A thief warrior. What, what would be a thief warrior? Fucking. I got nothing for that. I don't know if Let's keep all going. of them will be unlocked this way, and I didn't get a chance to unlock any of the hybrid ones, like Mystic Spear Hand or Magic Archer, but I definitely like the idea of not having to grind vocations in order to unlock others. My personal That's favorite good. of the vocations I got to try was by far the Warrior, who maintains the fantasy of being the great sword wielding badass. I mean, he really is just knocking them down. Just. <laughs> It swings heavy, and it the the important bit is it it looks effective. Like look how much it throws them around, and this is important when you're playing because if the animation looks effective and there's that weight behind the hits, you feel that as the player. 
favorite of the vocations I got to try was by far the warrior. See how you see how it pauses for a second as he hits. That brings giant and it, it, to there's like a there's like a hit and then a follow through. Also adds a few more tricks to the repertoire. Director Hideaki Itsuno That's what gives it that big punch. Didn't feel like a super that big punchy feeling in the first game and thus worked hard to give them some new elements to bring out their strengths. For starters, we've jacked up the warrior's offense and destructive power to the point where it's unfair. In exchange, its abilities take a little longer to execute. This makes the vocation somewhat difficult to use. But that's where the tackle comes into play. Okay, the tackle. So they had a problem. They just had a problem with it being a little too tanky. So they had to find a way to give them speed. And the tackle is perfect because you can charge down your enemies, get in close, f fuck them up with your double hit broadsword. Ridiculous. If you're attacked, you can use the tackle to cause an enemy to be stunned instead of being stunned yourself, making it easier to get into the location. The tackle he's referring to is a new ability called Bard Boom. that allows the warrior to execute a quick shoulder bash, even while nice. they're charging an attack to interrupt. And Lacks the power to make up for it, it makes up in swiftness. Yeah, it just it just you know stuns them a bit and potentially stun any enemy that's trying to stuff their attack uh -huh. the location after all is built around being able to charge up massively powerful attacks that deal humongous damage so this small change goes a long way in making it a little easier to get those big shots off my favorite new addition for the warrior though is a passive skill that allows you to swing regular attacks not as asshole quickly if you're able to precisely time your next oh, is, oh you can see his booty oh no this gives a nice rhythm to the warrior's combat now you can't stop looking at it player to compensate you're welcome for the typical weakness of having a very slow attack while still making those very slow and powerful attacks still feel like they have their own place in the warrior skill set also that's good that's good but is that so that that sword power up is in his skill set is that what we kind of like Makes him pump up like that? I don't know. Greg looks like he's about to get fucked up, though. If you're like me and enjoy the feeling of leaping off cliffs and slamming your weapon down on... Because even that... It's so good. Just even the splash gets you. Monster's head. This is the vocation for you. I unfortunately oh, that's going to be so satisfying. Sorcerer vocation to see any of the... Kind of like Monster Hunter when you're sliding down the hill and you get that jump attack. Mm. Really big, crazy spells that they're so beloved for. But what I really enjoyed about the Sorcerer was the... He just stun locks him. Just shock, shock, shock. Over and over. To see any of the really big, crazy That's like when you're getting hit so with a straight jab really in Mortal Kombat. About the Sorcerer was the addition of a unique skill called Galvanize. This allows you to go into a stance that recovers your stamina extremely Shocked his tail quickly, off. Which My is God. especially useful for the sorcerer due to the fact that their spells take so long to cast. To shorten those spells... Oh, okay. So it's not traditional. It's got a charge to it. It's not just like... With your shit. You actually got to cast your spell and do the whole fucking thing. And then it comes out. I do like that. I do like that, though, because it, re it requires, like, the class setup. You know, you have the tank and fighter go in, distract him while you in the back, just charging up your fucking soul bomb. That's how, you know, that's just good setup. Good setup. Else, you need to use a skill called and quick spell. That's what it's going to be about. To spend stamina to reduce the spell's cast time. Mm, All of this needs okay. to careful balance. So it's meter management. So you can use. Was it a stamina bar? She said. He said you can use stamina bar. So you to spend stamina to reduce the spell's cast. Time. Yeah, this interesting. I actually really like that idea. So you use your magic to cast the spell, but of course you want to cast the spell with a little more like. So it puts a strain on your body. Which takes your stamina. That makes perfect sense, logically. And the fact that they fit it so easily into a mechanic like that, and it hasn't, I haven't really seen that done. Really cool. Really cool. Nice little twist. 
this leads to a careful balance of preparing to cast a powerful spell, using quick mm -hmm. spell to shorten its cast time, and then making note of whether you have enough stamina to cast another spell, yep. or whether you have to break Dodge. away and use Galvanize to get your stamina back up. It's a fun dance okay. that makes Sorcerer okay. feel a lot more active than in the past. So, but I don't see I don't see a mana bar either. So, is the cost of casting the spell the time to cast it? Time is the cost. That that I, I don't mind that I don't mind that being a thing, and like your guy just has the magic. It's just a matter of just give me a second, bro. Just give give me three seconds, <laughs> and then I swear I'm coming through. I hate you. The power Dragon's of distance. Open world is enormous. Reported to be Yo, I don't wanna I don't wanna be walking around the whole time. I don't I don't want half my gameplay to be meandering. Roughly four times the size of the already huge map in the first game. And I don't doubt that claim Big does bigger does not mean better. Bigger does not mean better. Right boys? in my experience of checking out the map and wandering through just a small portion of it. It's big, but it's also dense with exciting encounters both on That's and important. off the beaten path that were paced nicely so I wasn't constantly slowed down by back-to-back -back battles, but I... Yeah, yeah, that, that's the thing. It, not just density, because if it's just like a bunch of enemies over and over and it's like the same thing over and over, not good. But if there's multiple little things to do, different kinds of shit, and different things to draw your eye, and then you're like, holy shit, I am halfway to my destination already. And you don't even know, because you've just been wandering. That's cool. But, yeah, I mean, he I'll take his word for it. He played 10 hours. I mean, shit. It also never went too long without having something to engage with. One That's thing good. that was important to eat to know and the team at Capcom was making sure that the players really felt the distance that they were traveling as they explored. To that end, fast travel That's that is such a neutral statement. That's not even that's not a good or bad. It, it's completely depending on context. Oh, what what do they say? They explored. To that end, oh. fast travel making sure that the players really felt the distance that they were traveling as they explored. To that end, felt felt the distance they were traveling. I don't know if that's good. I don't think that's good. I don't want to feel the distance that I travel. I mean, for the most part, Red Dead Redemption 2 was very scenic. That that definitely had some some stretches of just running around on your horse. Is it going to be like similar to that for a second and then something happens? I, don't know, I just don't want travel time to take up too much time. That's all I'm saying. Fast travel is very limited, like in the first game. You can only travel between discovered port crystals, and every time you do, you must expend a fairy stone, which are highly okay. valuable items that don't come cheap and aren't easily found. That'll be a thing. That 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 might hold me back a bit if I get like turned around somewhere and I'm like, oh shit. I'm not even supposed to be in this town. But I was I was just seeing what was over on the other side of shit. And then you got to walk all your ass all the way back cuz you ain't got a stone. There you go. Another option you have for getting around is using an op Then again, he also played 10 hours, so is this something that he was told that they would be super rare or something that was super rare during his first 10 hours? And then, like, more end game when you start really, really fleshing out shit is when you get a little more abundance of that of that fast travel. That, that wouldn't be so bad. Ox cart, which is relatively cheap, but they are limited in the fact that you can't choose where you travel. The main one that I found only went from the capital city of Vernworth to the checkpoint town, which was far to the west. You also have to consider that ox carts are not a completely safe way to travel. See, look how slow, look how slow that feels. I don't want, I don't want that to be the whole. 
as they often will be ambushed by all manners of beasts. Yeah. Of course, you can just hoof it on foot, which is where you'll truly feel the weight of that distance, especially due to really? the new health restoration mechanic. It feels like it feels like they're going faster than the cart, to be honest. Like look at look at look at that speed difference. Down, which was far to the west. You also have to consider that this ox carts are not a completely safe way to travel, as they often will be ambushed by versus all manners of beasts. Of course, you can just hoof it on foot, which is where you'll truly this. feel the weight. I of think they're I think the running's especially faster. Especially due to the new health restoration mechanic known as loss gauge. Loss gauge, health restoration mechanic. Is it restoration if it's called a loss? In the first game, you'd be able to heal your entire life bar by using health restorative items mm -hmm. and recoverable gray health with spells. In Dragon's okay. Dogma 2, however, every hit diminishes a portion of your max health, and the only ways to restore it are either by finding a campfire to rest at or returning to an inn and resting for the night. Oh, man. So it's like a risk-reward, like how, how much you really want to be out here. You got you got three quarters of your health left. You can probably push it out for a little bit longer, but them hits are gonna be hitting a little hittier. So you know how 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 many times can you take them hits before you have health permanently? You know, don't want that. Fortunately, if you rest at a campfire, that looks so you good. You can also cook some meat and get some much-needed buffs you do in this addition to, to restoring all of your life. But there's a risk involved with resting at a campfire as well. The flames may attract monsters to your campsite, and... That's what attracted the griffin. They had that shit blazing in the middle of the night. That's what it was. That's what it was. You gotta keep the fires down. Didn't you watch Lord of the Rings? Come on. Come on. As I mentioned at the beginning of this preview, you can actually wake up to an angry griffin coming back to finish what it started. Yo. What it all comes down to is this. Virtually every action in Dragon's Dogma 2 has some combination of a cost and a risk tied to it. Fairy stones. That's perfectly okay. I, I, I think that adds a lot of tension to the gameplay, to every aspect of the gameplay. And therefore makes you feel limited, so you have to get a little more creative when you're more limited. It's just natural byproduct are risk-free travel, but they come at a very steep price. Ox carts are a low-cost but moderately risky method of travel and tra Yo, do you see how dark it was? They ain't kidding, it is night time. You can't see anything but where the fire is. But moderately risky method Look of that. travel and traveling on foot is free but oh my extremely God. risky. Then you must also consider whether it's worth it to press on in a quest line with low max health or backtrack to a town to resupply, whether you should avoid fighting the giant. So part of it is surviving the travel to places. Like it's part it's part of the adventure. Which re really, yeah, Lord Lord of the fucking Rings. Part of the adventure is the journey there. And they're embodying that giant tanky ogre or risk it all on trying to bring it down to experience and rare material reward whether you should keep on the less dangerous beaten path or take a detour into the unknown In the <laughs> all those boys that I played, gone these were very compelling that's going that's going to be me make. but the real test will be whether those decisions because i'm gonna i'm gonna hoof it like skyrim style be like we can we can go right through we can just go right through we can definitely we can definitely sneak past the dragon, no issues. Remain compelling or turn exhausting in hour twenty or thirty when the map has expanded dramatically and you still have quests remaining to complete in a town that you're super far away from. It's gonna be big. Hypotheticals aside, though, I love just about every moment that I spent playing Dragon's Dogma Two during this preview window. It doubles down on everything that I love from the first game makes some smart improvements to the way quests are handled. Man, that's so quick. He, it looked like he barely even had control. Like his blades go on autopilot. This preview window. It doubles down on everything that I love from the first Just game. <laughs> makes some smart improvements to the way quests are handled and how you explore its giant world and the little taste that I got of the vocations is oh, a tantalizing out the reminder ass. of why Dragon's Dogma is one of the be cool best as fuck, in the though. genre when it comes to delivering on the various power fantasies tied to the classic RPG mm. archetypes. Even after all I played, I still feel like I just scratched the surface on what Capcom has in store for players when Dragon's Dogma 2 releases on March 22nd.
This scene right here reminds me so much. So much. Of Witcher 3. The griffin in the field? Come on. Still feel like it's I just scratched the surface iconic. of what Capcom has in store for players when Dragon's Dogma 2 releases on March 22nd. March 22nd. March 22nd. Okay. Okay. Really thinking about it. I am excited for this. I am excited. Love the fantasy. Love the realism. The real, like the the realistic fantasy. It doesn't look super arcadey. The climbing mechanic, fantastic. Can't wait to see how that's used in the crazier monsters. What kind of monsters are going to be past the ten hours that they played? We've only had little snippets. And then he was talking about hybrid classes. I want to. I want to know what that's all about. What kind of classes can I get my hands on? How many? How many times am I gonna have to play this game? You know. Well, let me know what you think. Let me know if you're gonna play it. Let me know if you're gonna play it. <laughs> 